And welcome to the latest in our series of programming languages talks where we get people from within and without Google to come and give talks about interesting topics in programming languages. One of the most interesting topics in programming languages right now is the notion of transactional memory. And that is what our speaker today is going to speak about. Uh, our speaker today is Mark Moyer, who works at Sun Labs, and before that was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh for four years, and before that uh, was at UNC, and before that was at the University of Maryland for a very brief period of time, and in New Zealand, and I'm sure that he can fill in more if you actually want to know. Um, and uh, he will be talking, as I said, about transactional memory, and at, uh, and at that point, I will turn it over to him. I don't think, uh, I don't think you're they turned me back on. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, turns out that Jeremy can reverse a story that you tell him uh, accurately. So very good. <laughs> um, so my screen is not working. I'll use this one. You guys watch that one. So um, thanks for the introduction. I'm Mark Moyer. I lead the Scalable Synchronization Research Group at Sun Labs. And I'm going to tell you about some of the work that uh, we do on transactional memory. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you that it's, as Jeremy said, a very popular hot topic uh, in, uh, in a variety of research communities these days. This is a um, very brief list of conferences uh, off the top of my head that have had papers directly related to transactional memory. Uh, I'm sure it's not complete. I'm sure it's not even accurate, but it gives you a rough idea. Um, do you have a pointer? Laser pointer or something? No? Uh, the mouse I can't see on there, so that's fine anyway. Um, you can see up in the top left there, there's a couple of papers in the early to mid-90s uh, sort of introducing the idea of transactional memory. Um, then a period of some quiet, um, which is not like nothing was going on. I've alighted most of my own career from here. But in the last few years, there's just been an absolute explosion of excitement, enthusiasm, and uh, innovation around transactional memory across a whole bunch of conferences. And you can see workshops dedicated to transactional memory popping up. So why is that? Why, why is this all, all this excitement right now? Well, um, as I think most of you know anyway, uh, the long tradition of waiting until next year's processor came out to hide your software bloat is coming to an end. And the reason is that although Moore's Law continues and set, looks set to continue for a while yet, um, the practice of uh, running things faster and making them more complex in order to make single processors go faster is running into diminishing returns and perhaps more importantly uh, running into uh, fundamental limits uh, with power and uh, heat that are just not acceptable. Um, some percentage of data centers that I don't remember are at or very close to their power uh, and heat and cooling and space budgets, and this is an area of great concern. And so it's not okay to just keep going for single-threaded performance at, uh, at all costs. So there's been a fairly dramatic shift uh, over the last few years in the computer industry towards building not bigger, better, faster, stronger processors, but putting more cores on a single processor chip, making them smaller, uh, sacrificing to some extent the single threaded performance in order to get uh, better throughput. So you have lots of cores on the same chip, and e each one of those might not be twice as fast as last year's one, but you've got lots of them. You might have twice as many as, as last time sort of thing. So this is great for throughput. If you've got a whole bunch of machines in your server room running a whole bunch of applications, you can take a bunch of those, put them on a single multi-core system, and get better throughput, easier administration, less heat, less power, less cooling, and all of that. However, what about if you would like to exploit advances in technology to improve the performance of your single application? Well. What it means is basically that application is going to have to be able to take advantage of multiple cores concurrently, and that increasingly means that ordinary programmers will have to become concurrent programmers. But here's the problem. Concurrent programming is way too hard. Um, today's uh, synchronization in today's concurrent programs is largely based around locks and condition variables, which introduce a variety of uh, uh, problems and trade-offs with performance, scalability, and software engineering, and only experts can really get it right, and the truth is they don't get it right all the time either, and there are lots of painful, subtle concurrency bugs that are difficult to reproduce, difficult to diagnose, and so on. And so this is a real problem now, and it's going to get worse as more and more 
programmers need to become concurrent programmers. So our strong belief is that transactional memory can help. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So I've got a silly little example here. Um, my silly little example is slightly different from everyone else's silly little example, but they're all pretty silly and little. But anyway, here, here's the example. So suppose I have a system that has a bunch of FIFO queues in it, um, <clears throat> which I'd like to share amongst uh, a bunch of threads on a bunch of cores. If I use a single lock to protect all of those queues, then life is simple but not scalable, right? That lock becomes a bottleneck. So I'd like to have one or maybe two locks per queue. However, suppose that in my system I've implemented these FIFO queues, I've got NQ and DQ operations, and then one day I decide, hmm, wouldn't it be good if I had an operation which would transfer a value from the end of one, or the front of one queue to the end of another, and let that happen atomically. In other words, so no other thread will notice, for example, that the item is missing from any of the queues, or that it's in both of the queues at the same time. I'd like not to have to worry about that possibility in the rest of my code. I'd like to just have uh, to uh, make it appear to everyone else as if this happened uh, instantaneously. So I take my lock-based implementation and I try to compose the NQ and DQ into a transfer value operation like this one. So here's some code on the right, uh, sorry, on the left. Uh, I hope all of you already spotted three problems with it. Um, the first one is that because I've got to hold the locks for both queues while I do these operations, I can no longer hide the implementation inside these operations. I've got to expose those locks to the client code, and that means that the programmer has got to know the locking convention, remember it, and obey it. Uh, and so that's ugly for software engineering purposes, of course, if I'd like to improve the implementation of, of the FIFO queues, I've then got to go and change the code that uses it everywhere. Uh, obviously, not ideal. Uh, and furthermore, as I'm sure you spotted, this, uh, quote, solution is broken because there's deadlock. If, uh, if there's a transfer from Q1 to Q2 concurrent with a transfer from Q2 to Q1, they'll grab those locks in a different order and nothing much will happen for quite a long time. Uh, and so to address that problem, you have to make this code even uglier than it is. And since my point is not to teach you how to program with locks, I won't bother doing that. But instead, I'll show you an alternative. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just say it? I want to do this code atomically and leave it to the system to figure out how to support that atomicity. Uh, I'm sure you would all agree you'd rather write that code than that code if all else were equal. And particularly, you'd rather write that code than the fixed up code th to avoid deadlock. So, no surprises, transactional memory is a strong candidate for implementing this kind of semantics, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'll stop for a minute here, um, since somebody asked me on the way over from lunch this question, who's in your group? Uh, let me introduce my group very quickly. Uh, the top bullet is the, uh, are the main members of my group. Um, Dave Dice recently joined us from Java Software Organization. Uh, Victor Luchanko has been with us for a while. He's a language and theory expert. Um, then me. We just hired Kevin Moore. He joined us a couple of weeks ago from the University of Wisconsin. And Dan Nussbaum uh, has been with us for a few years, as has Nir Shavit. We also work a lot with uh, Professor Morris Herlihy uh, from Brown University. And uh, I was going to say we work a lot with uh, Yossi Lev, but it would be more accurate to say he works a lot with us. Um, he's, he's our eternal intern. So here uh, is just a sampling of some relevant to transactional memory papers written by members of my group, not necessarily while they're in my group. The first one is a sort of a seminal uh, paper proposing hardware transactional memory back in ISCA 93 by uh, Morris Hilhey and Elliot Moss. Um, there's, there's also a short while later proposal for software transactional memory, or they, they, they coined the term software transactional memory and introduced that idea. That was Nir Shavit and one of his students, Dan Tuitu. Uh, last year in ASPLOS, I and other members of my group published a paper on hybrid transactional memory. I'm going to talk uh, in some amount of detail about that today. Um, Dave Dice and Nir Shavit, together with Nir's student Ori Shalev, who was also a former intern of ours, uh, came up with the TL2, Transactional Locking 2, Software Transactional Memory Algorithm, which is uh, a sig significant advance in software transactional memory and widely regarded to be one of the state-of-the-art ones. Um, 
Last year, Morrison, Victor, and I published a paper in Uppsala presenting DSTM2, which is a Java-based framework that allows you to plug in your STM implementation and, uh, and compare it against other STM implementations using the same programming interface. Um, and it comes with a couple of sort of uh, straw man implementations as well for, for you to look at and play with. And that's uh, available. You can download it and play with it, uh, as is TL2, uh, by the way. And then I had to reduce this font on this slide yesterday to add in LogTM since we just hired Kevin. Uh, LogTM is a hardware-based tra uh, unbounded transactional memory proposal, and I'll say what that means in just a minute. In just a minute. And Kevin and his colleagues at Wisconsin uh, have worked on that. So here's a really broad strokes uh, summary of, of approaches to implementing transactional memory. The first one is a bounded hardware transactional memory, which is what uh, Morris and Elliot proposed back in ISCA 93. Basically, the idea for implementing a transaction is you gather together all of the cache lines covering the variables that you like to access in your transaction. While you've got exclusive ownership of them, you can make a local decision to apply things to them, quote, atomically. And because you don't give up the cache lines until you've done that, uh, no one can tell that it wasn't atomic. So that's nice and simple, fits with existing cache coherence protocols and so on. but it's bounded. It's implemented in a fixed size transactional cache. And so a programmer needs to be aware of that cache and its size and think about whether his or her transaction will map into that, will fit into that structure. Now, I would argue, you know, remember I said what we're trying to do here is make concurrent programming easier. I would argue that if we ask programmers to start thinking about how many uh, cache lines are touched by each uh, block of their code, we probably didn't help them much. So that's why I've got this big fragile thing next to it. It's, it's, it's not a, uh, doesn't support, directly support a very good programming model. Um, the next bullet here is for best effort hardware transactional memory. So that's like bounded in the sense that it can commit some transactions and not other transactions. And so again, the programmer needs to, to understand uh, what to do in case the, the transactional memory doesn't, doesn't support the particular transaction. And the situation is actually even worse here because um, best effort, I should clarify here what I mean too. Best effort is not a particular implementation that I have in mind, so please don't ask me for the details of it. It's a class of things. What it means is give me your best effort, right? You commit whatever transactions you can, and whatever transactions you can't, don't commit them. So now it's not I commit everything up to 64 cache lines and nothing beyond. It's I might support this huge transaction and not be able to support that small one. And so this, from a programmer's point of view, is even more fragile, right? But uh, it, but it's uh, easier and more flexible from a hardware designer's point of view because they don't have to make specific guarantees about exactly which transactions will and won't uh, be able to commit. So the fragility of those kind of uh, uh, designs, I think, is a big part of the reason that in the, in the 15 plus years since transactional memory has been proposed, it has not, uh, not become widely adopted. And recognizing that, and also the increasing importance of making concurrent programming easier in the past few years, there have been uh, quite a lot of proposals for so-called unbounded hardware transactional memory, meaning the hardware transactional memory has to be able to commit all the transactions, and it doesn't matter if they don't fit in the cache or uh, whatever. And so all of these proposals do something along the lines of, you know, they all try to use the caches for performance, but when they exceed the bounds of the cache or some other resource on chip, they then start uh, spilling data out into into memory, out into the address space of, of the thread that's executing it, and that results in a really big jump in complexity. And I would say, I mean, things are improving, but almost all of the um, proposals out there are sufficiently complex and leave unresolved a sufficient number of difficult and critical issues that it's too risky and too complex uh, for us to expect it to uh, show up in our hardware uh, in the near future. So. Recognizing all of that and the fact that we don't have anything to play with, people came up with the idea of software transactional memory, and there's, again, been a lot of work on software transactional memory. Much more flexible, doesn't have these issues, uh, you know, architecture-specific issues, but, of course, as you would expect, it's significantly more uh, expensive than what a hardware transactional memory could be reasonably expected to do. I'd say roughly one to two orders of magnitude is, is a good way to think about it. So that's kind of the, uh, of the broad picture of, of ways to implement trans transactional memory. And that's still it. 
Okay. Two orders of magnitude uh, adjusted transactions are on everything in your program. Um, so that. that it depends on some uh, issues, d depending what kind of model you'd like to support. Uh, that's that's a key issue in uh, under discussion in implementing software transactional memories these days. Uh, but but the short answer is there are so, there are there are systems that have the, the answer is either one of those two. And if you want some stronger guarantees, you then have to go and put. Uh, um, uh, the overhead on even non-transactional code. Um, that can be largely optimized away, but it's still significant. Because there are people listening remotely, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, when I said you should think of software transactional memory as, as roughly one to two orders of magnitude slower than hardware transactional memory, the question was, do you mean for the transactional code or for all code? OK, and I guess now you can rewind and listen to the answer. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, okay, so we, recognizing that all of the classes of proposals had some significant drawbacks, came up with the idea of hybrid transactional memory, which I'll talk about for a while now. So hybrid transactional memory has at least a fully functional software transactional memory. And that means that it can operate in existing systems today with no additional hardware support, allowing programmers to start developing, testing uh, transactional programs, getting a feel for transactional programming styles, and so on. Hybrid transactional memory goes past software transactional memory in that it can uh, use best effort hardware transactional memory to improve performance, right? Uh, and so because, it, because best effort hardware transactional memory is sufficient, that significantly simplifies the burden on a hardware designer who would like to support a transactional programming mo model. Okay? There's more flexibility, so if you get into a particular corner case or there's some case that you think is going to be very rare but is going to slow things down uh, in the common case, you can simply say, I'm not going to support that case. If I ever run into it, I'll just abort the transaction, leave software to deal with it. Um, it also means you can pick and choose which of the many features that, you know, for, for every bizarre feature, there's at least three people who think that the world will not make progress until this is supported in transactional memory. Uh, hardware designers can choose which ones they think are going to be the ones that are important to make common and that they can fit into their complexity and risk profile and integrate with whatever other ideas they're doing in their, in their next uh, processor. So best effort is significantly easier and simpler to implement in hardware than unbounded. And I believe that, 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 that making best effort hardware transactional memory useful is critical to beginning the process of, of, um, of using hardware transactional memory or adopting transactional memory in general. So here's a silly little uh, picture that kind of uh, um, illustrates the idea. Here we have the big heavy weight software transactional memory I drew on the previous slide. Of course, we and others continue to make significant progress to improve the um, overheads. But now, if someone comes along and puts transactional memory onto a chip, then we can improve the performance of the hybrid transactional memory system using that software transactional memory. It's not required. You can run without it. It'll improve, improve performance when it comes. And you can put transactional memory plus on your next chip improve its performance, improve the, the size and number of transactions that it can commit, or the functionality that it supports. And so we, we, we turn what really used to be a catch-22, where software guys wouldn't write transactional software because there was no support, and hardware guys wouldn't support hardware transactional memory because there were no programs, into a more sort of uh, cooperative relationship where each encourages and motivates and guides the other to get better and better. And uh, just as an aside, I was the one who put this, this uh, rotated TM on this chip. The chip I stole from Morris Hurley here, if you recognize any, you probably recognize his little chips. I put the TM on there. I can tell you it's hard to put TM on a chip. That rotation was really tricky. So anyway, this is the, this is the idea with hybrid transactional memory. Let's get started. Let's try to encourage people to give us hardware support, and we can continue improving as we go along. OK, so the basic idea, or basic design philosophy is a familiar one. Make the common case fast and make the uncommon case work correctly so that programmers don't have to think about uh, alternative or backup mechanisms which would complicate their code significantly. Um, and of course, the idea is we'll use ha hardware transactional memory for the hopefully common case to make it fast. And otherwise, we use a compatible software transactional memory. And that compatible is important. To explain why. The hardware and software transactions must 
interoperate with each other correctly, right? So, for example, what if a transaction executed using hardware transactional memory conflicts with one executed using software transactional memory? We should detect that and make sure that, that uh, the system behaves correctly. And, of course, software is just one of those applications out of there from the hardware point of view, so the hardware transactional memory is not um, specifically aware of the software transactional memory. So instead, the idea is you make the code executed using hardware transactions aware of the software transactions and leverage the hardware transactional memory as a more generic facility. So I'm going to try not to get into too much technical detail, um, but just to give you sort of a little bit of insight into how this works, our prototype that we've built and is described in our ASPLOS paper last year comprises a library and a compiler, and the compiler produces a code path to execute transactions with hardware and a code path to execute it with software transactional memory. And in both paths, it inserts appropriate calls into the library. Uh, and here is an explanation of what goes on in, in, the, in the hardware path. So here's a tiny little transaction, x and y are shared variables. And um, I, I can't write assembly code, and I don't want to ask you to read it right after lunch. So this is sort of, you know, you, you translate the pseudo code in your head if you can. Uh, don't worry if, if you can't. It's not really the point. So this is the functionality that the compiler produces. So it, it emits a transaction, uh, uh, an instruction to begin a hardware transaction, specifies an address to go to if uh, the transaction is unable to be committed, it aborts. And then here's the normal code, load x into a temporary variable, add 5 to and add it to y. But these additional things in yellow here um, give us the hooks to detect conflicts with software transactions. So for just before a read, we call can hardware read this address, and just before a write, similarly, we, we call can hardware write, and the library makes the decision whether there is a potential conflict with a software transaction. If it says no, the, transaction, the hardware transaction explicitly aborts itself, and so therefore we don't have, uh, we, we eliminate potentially incorrect conflicts between software and hardware transactions. So, um, the basic idea of what goes on in the library to support that, software transaction maintain data structures for read-write ownership of, of the locations that they're accessing, and those can hardware read and can hardware write library functions look up those data structures to, to, um, to detect a potential conflict. And if there is a conflict, they say, no, you can't do that. The transaction aborts itself explicitly. If there is not a conflict that time, at that time, the library will say, sure, go ahead, it's fine. But what if a, a conflict shows up later? Well, because this can hardware read was called within a hardware transaction, if a software conflict actually shows up later and before that hardware transaction commits, that'll cause that hardware transaction to abort. So that's a key point in understanding why it's OK to say, yeah, there's no conflicts now, and don't worry if they arise in the future. Uh, OK. So I'm going to present some experiments uh, that we've done with our hybrid transactional memory prototype. We've done these on several platforms. I'm going to talk about two. One is a big, real multiprocessor machine, and we can do that because we don't depend on hardware transactional memory. Um, and then the other is a simulator that supports a form of best effort hardware transactional memory. The simulator um, starts with uh, Simix and the Wisconsin GEMS memory model and the Wisconsin LogTM simulator, which simulates that unbounded hardware transactional memory proposal that I mentioned earlier that Kevin and others have worked on. So we start with that. We rewire the instructions produced by our compiler so that they uh, call the hardware instructions uh, supported by the LogTM simulator. That's just a little bit of plumbing, no big deal. Uh, but more uh, importantly, at the next two points, we added support for failing and support for an explicit abort handler. Because LogTM is an unbounded hardware transactional memory, it's it's mission in life is to get that transaction done. It doesn't need a software interface for saying, oh, gee, I couldn't do it, right? But a best effort hardware transactional memory has the flexibility for any transaction to say, ah, too hard, ah, too many resources, ah, I got a context switch, whatever. It can just abort whenever it wants to and branch to that fail address that I talked about. And then we can either retry or we can go and uh, execute it in software transactional memory. And that is controlled by policies in the library that we can uh, configure. And then finally, we so-called neutered LogTM. Again, LogTM is an unbounded hardware transactional memory that has additional complexity for spilling things out into memory and uh, uh, metadata out in memory state and so on. 
we said forget all of that we're just going to make we're just going to pretend like it all uh, uses only on chip resources so if we get a cache eviction for something we've read transaction we're just going to kill the transaction at that point we're not going to go off and do the complicated log tm stuff and similarly we say if the log which is is the the list of places that you've written to gets past a certain size which is you know controllable as a parameter in our simulator then we'll just abort the transaction too and so the idea is to sort of give ourselves a so-called best effort hardware transactional memory to play with where it supports some transactions but it also puts the burden back on us the hybrid transactional memory library designers uh, in other cases. Uh, feel free to slow me down or ask questions or whatever. Mm. Go ahead. Okay. So, all right. So, so the question is basically about the details of how uh, how the hardware transactional memory asks the software for permission or or whether there's a potential conflict, right? So, uh, so again, the the hardware transactional memory doesn't know about the the software or the hybrid transactional memory. It just executes memory transactions. Where the, the hook is, is in the code produced by the compiler for the hardware path, right? So the compiler uh, emits calls into the library. The library contains the software transactional memory implementation, so it, it understands how ownership data is maintained and so on. And so the, those special library calls that are used as sort of the, the glue between hardware and software transactions, they know. They go look up the software transactional memory metadata. But so essentially, that's how it's done. So on the hardware path, you actually make to a software library to, to determine whether a particular write read is legal. That's right. Um, sh should I also repeat his comment? I, I think he just accurately summarized what I said, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, on the data, do you have to do the software teams, eventually you have to write them or create them anonymously to write what other services and group there, how do you do that? Um, okay, sorry, can you? So, the data structures you maintain for yeah. software management memory, right? Yeah. They have to also be updated. Oh, so, so... How do you ensure that? Oh, okay. So the, the metadata that I'm talking about that the... All right, now the question is about uh, how... Uh, does, you know, the, the, this, it's kind of like the question is, is it turtles all the way down, right? So how, how do you update this metadata? So um, uh, if you don't have hardware transactional memory, which presumably you don't because you're on the path where the hardware transactional memory didn't work, right? Okay, so, so that's a good question. Um, and really I spent the first uh, 10 years of my career training to answer that question. Basically it's, it's uh, um, tricky blocking or non-blocking synchronization down in the library. Now the programmer never has to see or understand that code, but it's the kind of code that we're trying to uh, make sure no one else has to write in the future. Yeah, but it's, it's using compare and swap, for example, to make sure if, if you and I are both trying to acquire ownership of something, you know, you can think of it, uh, you know, simplistically as a bunch of read-write locks. It's more than that, but that's sort of a reasonable uh, analogy. Okay. All right, so those are our two experimental platforms. Um, and I'll talk, we've done a, a number of benchmarks, not enough, I don't think anyone's done enough benchmarks and there are not enough real applications out there, but things are improving dramatically in the last year and uh, hopefully we'll continue to do so. A couple of the benchmarks, or the first benchmark that I'm going to um, concentrate on most today uh, involves the Berkeley DB lock subsystem. So as you probably know, Berkeley DB is an open source database system. Um, it has a, uh, a lock subsystem in it which supports uh, both the database implementation and is also exposed to clients. And what it does is it manages locking for, for the client. So the client says, here's an object, I'd like to lock it for reading or I'd like to lock it for writing. The lock subsystem is responsible for finding the lock that's associated with this object if there is one, or allocating and initializing one if there is not one, and then uh, handling the synchronization so that the right, uh, so that it grants permission to the clients uh, appropriately. Um, the production implementation uh, in Berkeley DB that everyone's using uses a single lock, an implementation lock, not to be confused with the locks being implemented, to protect all of the data structures required to do that. And um, what no? I thought I heard a question. Okay. So we, 
went and transactified that code. In other words, we went in and said, okay, instead of using that single uh, lock to protect these data structures, we're going to access these data structures with transactions. And having done that, we then uh, you know, found that there was actually s centralized synchronization inside the library, not just for that lock, but also on things like free lists. And we did some additional work to distribute those free lists, which turns out that's kind of a tricky concurrency problem. But if you've got transactions, it's remarkably simple. So it kind of uh, gave us a real concrete feeling that, that uh, our intuitions were right. OK, now having done that, um, we then designed a real simple benchmark to test the scalability of our systems. So in this benchmark, we have some number of threads. You'll see that on the x-axis in all of the graphs that I show. Each thread has its own object, and it sits there and repeatedly locks and unlocks its own object. Okay? So from the client's point of view, there's no synchronization in this program. Right? They're all uh, accessing different objects. And so in, in principle, it should scale very well. Here are results on the big multiprocessor that I mentioned. Um, what we see, first of all, is that the original lock-based solution uh, scales very poorly. It, almost without exception, you add more threads, the performance gets worse. Okay? So the performance is measured in throughput operations per second. And so if, every, if we're doing things that don't synchronize and we add more threads, we should get more throughput, right? But in fact, we're getting less. And of course, the culprit is that single coarse-grained lock in, in the original implementation. And I want to point out, too, that these are both log scales. So that is uh, close to, not sure, maybe more than two orders of magnitude drop-off as you add it up to 127 threads. Very un... I don't, so you have a single lock shared among all the objects? That is in the production implementation of Berkeley DB. There's a single lock protecting the data structures used to implement the lock subsystem. So it's not that it uses a single client lock. It does allocate different locks for different objects, but to, to uh, synchronize the data structures required to uh, maintain those locks, it uses a single lock. Does that make sense? So on this chart, do you have any implementation which doesn't use transactional memory at all, it just uses plain locks? Uh, so the question is, do we have an implementation that doesn't use transactional memory, uh, but just uses plain locks? Yeah, I want a baseline for this to understand this graph. Okay, so you, oh, you mean plain client locks? So we yeah, we plain okay. Plain locks, I just want the baseline. For uh, understood. Yeah. All right. All right. So the question is, did we do the experiment where we don't use the Berkeley DB system at all for the locking? We just have a lock per object, and we sit and okay. Uh, no, we didn't do that. <laughs> that would be an interesting thing to do. But the, the point here, uh, really, I mean, that, that would scale well, but it's not really the point, right? The point is that you know, here's this complicated piece of, of, of production code with this single lock in there. And by the way, when we started digging into the source code for Berkeley DB, we found comments in there basically saying that the engineers who worked on this lock subsystem uh, explored fine-grained locking. They basically had it scoped out and roughly working, but they abandoned it because it was too complex to be worthwhile. And so that, again, made us feel like, oh, you know, if we can get the, the, the scalability of fine-grained locks with the programming uh, complexity of, of coarse-grained locks, that that's exactly kind of the, what transactional memory should try to achieve. Okay? Yeah? Uh, yeah, that's true. This, this benchmark is, sorry, so what's the question? Right. The question is, isn't this uh, experiment biased towards transactional memory because you're not going to have any um, aborts? Okay. So you're actually, you're sort of right and wrong. It's biased towards a good transactional memory implementation, right? Because a bad transactional memory implementation might itself use a coarse-grained lock to synchronize everything, and that would look bad as well, right? So yes, this is designed to demonstrate that a good transactional memory implementation can scale better than code that we find out there in, in the real world. So yeah, yeah, it's biased, but it's trying to make the point. Now, I've got another benchmark I'll show you in a, in a moment where, where we've deliberately put contention, and we'll, and we'll see a different story there. Okay, But what this shows is, first of all, that that coarse-grained lock doesn't scale. That's not very surprising to anybody. But it also uh, evaluates the scalability of various uh, transactional memory implementations. And what we've got here, of course, because this is running on a real machine, we're only using uh, software transactional memories. 
The blue one is the TL2 algorithm that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the green and orange ones are two variants of the software transactional memory that is a component of our hybrid transactional memory system. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about transactional memory, that one uses semi-visible reads and that one uses invisible reads and the, that kind of makes sense. I'm not going to go into that level of detail unless you beg me to. Um, okay, so, so uh, coarse grain locks scale really badly. The, um, the uh, transactional memories scale better in a situation where they should, right? That's, that's what we're, if we saw, I mean, so right here, look at this. That's a problem. That transactional memory implementation is not scaling well. And when we see that, we say, hey, we've got to go solve that problem. And, and, and what we figured out was that the, the semi-visible reads, which are great for hybrid transactional memory, were not great, so great for software-only transactional memory, OK? All right, so on the next slide, I'll show you these same curves again, but run on the simulator, together with some hybrid and hardware transactional memory implementations. So those are the same four curves that you saw looking roughly qualitatively similar. Uh, I'll point out that this is only up to 32 threads, uh, which is sort of pushing the bounds of what we can simulate in reasonable time. The top blue line there is the log TM. That's the unbounded hardware transactional memory used directly. And again, that is an unbounded hardware transactional memory that we believe entails too much complexity. So what we're really trying to show is how well can you do with best effort hardware transactional memory. And that's what we've got right here. Sorry, that's a little bit faint, but that blue line is our hybrid transactional memory using the simulated best effort hardware transactional memory. So there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is it's kind of disappointing. There's, uh, I, I think it's a factor of six or so uh, off of the unbounded hardware transactional memory. but you don't have hardware uh, unbounded hardware transactional memory. So in some sense, that's not the right comparison. Perhaps this is the right comparison. You can, with, with, this shows that you can get use best effort hybrid transactional memory to improve by, I think it's roughly, again, a factor of six over the, um, over the uh, software transactional memories. And out, at, out at here at 32 threads, you're improving over the, over the coarse grain lock, which is what's being used today in practice by two orders of magnitude. Yes. Why, uh, why isn't the hybrid the same as the log TM, the unbounded one? Because this is a simple case. It should always be. Okay. The, yeah. The, qu the question is why doesn't the hybrid transactional memory do as well as the unbounded one for this simple case? And uh, this is exactly what I'm going to get into. Okay. Oh, so one thing is we recently did uh, some inlining work, and that got us a factor of two, so now we're only a factor of three off of the hardware transactional memory, but um, we'd still like to do better. We'd, we'd like to understand, as you would, why do we have that remaining gap, right? And um, <clears throat> that, that's basically the point that we got up to with, with our hybrid transactional memory work, and, and we asked ourselves, I mean, that was a key question for us. Why can't we get closer? Where is the overhead here? And so this is what we figured out. First of all, the hybrid transactional memory imposes a significant overhead on the code path executed using hardware transactional memories in order to do those calls out into the library to uh, detect conflicts with the software transactions. Okay? So even if there aren't any software transactions, you've still got to go look up conflicts with them. And that accounts for a good chunk of that remaining Why gap. Necessary? Well, it's necessary because there might be software transactions, and if there are, you, okay, so there are software transactions. Why is it necessary? If your hardware transaction completes... Okay, so, so the question is why, why is it necessary, right? You've got atomic software transactions, you've got atomic hardware transactions, why don't they just play nicely, right? So the reason is that software transactional memory basically fakes atomicity. Right? So it, it can't arrange to actually go and change a bunch of memory locations instantaneously. Instead, what it does is it makes sure that no one notices that it's actually updating them one at a time. And so that no one has to include the hardware transactions. Does that make sense? In other words, it's the same overhead that you would impose on all code which doesn't use transactional memory at all just to make sure that it doesn't take out the subject transactions. Uh, again, uh, so, th so the question is, is this the same overhead we'd be imposing on all code, transactional and non-transactional? And again, that depends on the model. The, the, the buzzwords I, are... I'm assuming the, the start model. I mean, we, okay. models are not useful. 
Okay, that's a valid point of view, which I don't strongly disagree with. The, the, the comment was, weak models are not useful, so let's assume strong. Uh, I'm fine with that. Um, so uh, let me think. Yeah, so right, you would have to impose the same overhead on even non-transactional code uh, to go and make sure that it's playing correctly with potential software transactions that potentially conflict if you want the stronger model, which is called strong atomicity. That's right. Uh, I should say that you can optimize those overheads away quite a bit. Implementing a transaction that you know does a single read or a single write uh, is a lot simpler than a general transaction. Um, yeah? The question is, is this remaining overhead be because of... Oh, this one. Okay. Right. Uh, oh, and you're talking about the single-threaded case? Yes. Right. Okay. So why why the, uh, the the gap here? Is is it because you were calling software transactions or is it because of the overhead on the hardware transactions uh, produced by the need to look up for potential software transactions? Okay, got it. Uh, it's the latter. The, in, these, in this um, experiment, it's just about the hardware transactions. How well can we do when it's hardware transactions? Okay. So this is overhead for looking for conflicts with software transactions that don't exist, okay? All right, and so, and so you know, these questions are getting right to the matter of, of what we asked ourselves, and uh, what we found was, yeah, that overhead is significant, and even doing some inlining and some other engineering, there's still a significant gap. We're not gonna just engineer that stuff away, right? Unless we change to a different design point, so that's what we did next. Um, so, so, so we talked a lot about the overhead imposed on hardware transactions by hybrid TM. The other thing that hybrid TM, uh, the, the other aspect of hybrid TM that, that uh, makes life difficult for us is that the, the, the design space for the software transactional memory is constrained to allow those hardware, transactional, uh, hardware transactions to look it up, right? So what that means is on systems that don't have any hardware transactional memory, or on hypothetical future systems that have some best effort hardware transactional memory that happens not to be effective for my particular workload, it's tough to compete with the best software transactional memories out there because we have this constraint that they don't, right? So those two things made us basically uh, scratch our heads for a while and come around to this idea of what we call PHTM. It was gonna be called PTM, but uh, the folks at San Diego stole PTM at ASPLOS last year, so now we have PHTM. Um, so the idea with PHTM is you support different execution modes, and in, e in each mode you can have different, you know, entirely different implementations of transactional memory. They don't have to interact with each other because they're not executing concurrently, okay? And so you, you can imagine uh, many different varieties of, of modes, and I'll talk about a few on the next slide. And so of course the idea here is try to find the best mode for your workload, for your execution environment, and so on, and either stay there if those things are static, or dynamically uh, adapt and switch to another mode if, if your workload changes, or, or whatever the case is, okay? So here's a set of modes that you might consider. So the first one is hardware only mode, okay? In this mode, software transactions are not allowed to run. Therefore, we don't have to look for conflicts with them. And so we can eliminate all of that overhead that we just talked about. Forget inlining it, just throw it away. Um, then you might have a software mode where only software transactions will run. And so in that mode, you can use the state-of-the-art STM, more or less just plug it in because it doesn't need to provide the ability for hardware transactions to look it up. Okay, then you might have a hybrid mode that's, that's like what I've already described in some circumstances that might be the right thing to do. And another couple of modes you can think about. How about a sequential mode? If it's a sequential mode, this means there's only one transaction and so that transaction doesn't need to conflict, uh, detect conflicts with other transactions and that, that allows you to eliminate a lot of the overhead of software transactional memory. Um, particularly for single threaded cases uh, that would be a useful thing to do, right? And then going further, if you have 
uh, a single transaction which somehow you know, and perhaps it's through compiler analysis or perhaps because the program has promised, it will never request to explicitly abort itself, then you don't need to do logging to, uh, to roll it back either. And so you can get basically down to just executing the sequential code the same uh, as the coarse-grained lock does, right? So there's five modes. You can probably think of three variations on each one, and so it goes. Of course, in practice, you don't want to have every mode that you can think of for every possible workload and environment. You'd like to try and choose a sweet spot in the sort of complexity, flexibility trade-off. So to explore that and to explore the viability of the PHTM approach, um, we built a very simple prototype which supports just two modes, the hardware mode that I mentioned before, um, Plus the software mode, uh, plus a software mode, and the software mode is configured such that you can plug in different STM implementations, so we can compare different systems that would be hardware mode and software mode, and, and how is the software mode implemented? And so the idea is, you know, start in hardware mode. If you're lucky and everything always commits in hardware, then uh, you, you run almost unencumbered. It's not completely because you've still got to have a little bit of overhead to respect the mode, but you get rid of this read barrier and write barrier on every single transactional. Uh, memory operation. Um, then, of course, what if your best effort hardware transactional memory fails at some point? You can't just say, okay, bad luck, can't retry forever. You've got to switch modes. So you can switch to the software mode, execute that transaction in software, and then if it's appropriate according to your um, you know, monitoring and measuring and what, how it, whatever mechanisms you're using to try to adapt, then you can switch back to hardware. Or it might be that you figure out, look, it's just no, there's no point, let's stick in this software mode and let's use the best software transactional memory implementation we can for this workload, right? And you can imagine uh, implementations that have three modes and you can switch between two different types of, of software transactional memory. And as every, everybody who's written at least one paper in software transactional memory knows, the answer to the question of which one is best is it depends, right? And so uh, it might be that, you know, if you wanted to be, if you wanted to win in every single case, you'd probably have to have 17 STMs in there, but the right thing to do is, you know, <laughs> Pick the right number to keep your things simple. But, but the nice thing is that the, by separating the different STM implementations into different modes, the complexity is additive instead of multiplicative. You don't have to make all of them work in the same code base. You just sort of separate them out and run one at a time. Uh, okay, so there's the a little bit of detail here perhaps I won't get into, just talking about how do we make sure that we eventually get back to hardware mode and how do we make sure that we don't get back there too soon before the, uh, before the guys who wanted to go there are complete. So we do. It's, it's quite a simple mechanism. There's some details in our paper. I, I should have mentioned that we have a paper accepted to uh, the Transact workshop this year on this stuff, and I think we're supposed to finish that up in the next week or two. All right, so here are some experiments adding PHTM into the mix. Everything else that you saw is the same as before, and there is PHTM configured with two different STMs. One of them is TL2, and one of them is the STM from our hybrid implementation. You notice that they perform just the same as each other. That's not surprising because, again, in this benchmark, we're executing everything using only hardware transactions. But the nice thing is that this illustrates that this, the, the PHTM gives you more freedom and more flexibility in, in uh, implementing your software transactional memory implementation because the software transactional memory implementation doesn't have a performance impact on the hardware mode. It's not, uh, not relevant, uh, whereas it did for hybrid TM. And so you notice that we've now sort of eliminated another factor of three, and we're down to factor of two or so there. And uh, once more with inlining, um, we get a little bit closer again. Now I think it's roughly on the order of 50% uh, overhead uh, or 50% better performance for this hypothetical unbounded thing which we claim you can't have, right? So, well, can't have in the, in the short term. Um, so that's sort of where we're up to as of uh, yesterday. Um, Okay, so I promised you a benchmark where it's not sort of stacked in favor of no contention. This, this benchmark is a red-black tree accessed by this number of threads which repeatedly decide at random what operation to do, insert, delete, or look up. And I think it's 20% insert, 20% delete, and 60% look up, um, which is significantly more uh, mutation than a lot of the, the benchmarks out there do. Um, 
And uh, same thing again, operations completed per second across all threads, log log scale threads on the x-axis. So again, of course, we see the single lock uh, doing very, very badly. Some of the uh, STMs doing better. This is again only STMs because we're on the, on the real uh, multiprocessor here. And this, this benchmark is, if you like, uh, well, I'm trying to sort of change, change your words to say that this is not stacked in, in, in favor of the non-conflict situation. There are conflicts, right? If you've got 127 threads banging on a red black tree doing their insertions and deletions and rotations up towards the root and so on, there are going to be conflicts, right? And so what you see there, you know, the best implementation in the world is not going to be perfectly scalable because there, there really is interaction between the operations. But what we notice is that, again, the coarse-grained lock does very poorly. Some of the STMs do do much better. As you get more and more threads banging on it, the contention gets higher and higher. And so, of course, at some point it, it uh, doesn't scale, uh, doesn't continue to scale. And um, the STM with the semi-visible reads does even worse uh, than before. Um, and we actually have some ideas about that. Uh, maybe I'll tell you another day. Um, here, uh, the, the, here is the same experiment now run on the simulator and adding the uh, hardware transactional memory um, versions. Again, log TM at the top, hybrid transactional memory down here, and PHTM with the two different uh, STM variants. And you can notice now, although it's a little bit more noisy because of the contention, that actually the, the PHTM implementation is very competitive with log TM. And the reason now is uh, exactly like you said before, when there are no conflicts, it's all about the overheads on, on uh, no conflict. Now things are retrying, and so life is a lot more about fighting over cache lines and so on. And, and so those additional overheads on, on the PHTM uh, code path versus the unencumbered hardware path for the unbounded one, uh, they become much less relevant than the contention and fighting over cache lines. Um, so all of these things and other experiments we have done make us really convinced that we would like to have some hardware transactional memory support even before all those geniuses out there figure out all of their issues and figure out how you can really do unbounded hardware transactional memory um, and, and in a way that is robust and reliable enough to actually go and put into a, to a computer product. All right, so we're working on some other things too. I'll switch gears a little bit here. Um, our prototype that I've been talking about is built into a production quality C, C++ compiler, but it supports only a fairly uh, rudimentary programming interface, and of course we would like to uh, improve on that. And in fact, um, this is probably the reason that I'm here today, because I used to work with Lawrence at Sun before you people poached him. Um, <laughs> And, and we were having some discussions actually quite soon before he left. I don't think they were directly the reason he left, but <laughs> uh, you, you thought you could escape me. But I called him up and I said, Lawrence, let's write a paper about all those discussions we had. Otherwise, they're going to remain in our email buffers and no one's ever going to read them. So we did that. We wrote a paper. We submitted it to the Transact workshop and it got accepted. And uh, so now we have to polish it because it's not very polished at this point. Um, and it, it sort of, it's not a here's how to do it paper. It's here are many of the biggest issues. Here are some of the trade-offs involved. Here are our opinions on some of the issues. Other issues, we think we need to get some more experience before we decide what's the right thing to do here. And therefore, we think we should have an incremental approach where we do sort of the basic functionality first, encourage people to use it, test out what they need, what works, what doesn't, uh, and, and explore and go that way. And ideally, do it in an incremental fashion so that subsequent prototypes don't break the code written for earlier ones. And so, in several places in the paper, we say we prefer to do it this way first, even though that might be the right decision, because we can make the, we can change the decision that way without breaking anyone's code, but not the opposite. So um, it was fun writing that paper with you, Lawrence. A um, couple of the uh, sort of more interesting and thorny issues are mentioned here. I'm not going to go into any detail about them. One, one is that, that you've been asking about weak versus strong atomicity. Um, how do you integrate exceptions into transactional memory? That's a thorny issue, to say the least. How do you implement, how do you integrate transactional memory into debuggers in some kind of meaningful way? Like I said before, software transactional memory, and, and by extension hybrid and, and PHTM, uh, 
they fake atomicity, right? So if the, uh, if the debugger is not willing to go along with the story that those things are atomic, it's going to expose the illusion, and um, it'll probably uh, not be a very useful debugger. So uh, Yossi, uh, Lev, and I had a paper in Transact uh, last year describing some ideas about that. Now, we think we've made really good progress demonstrating the viability of hybrid transactional memory, showing that you can support transactional programming models where the programmer doesn't need to sit and think about architectural specific details in order to write programs using transactions. However, nonetheless, uh, and as sort of uh, illustrated by the fact that we're still writing papers and thinking about what the, what the programming model should be and how to support it, um, it'll be some time before transactional programming models become mature enough to be really used and, and uh, be adopted. But we think that we should not wait until then to start building hardware transactional memory, best effort, because best effort hardware transactional memory, in addition to helping uh, advance the state of, of transactional programming models, it also serves a bunch of other purposes. So you can use it for reducing lock bottlenecks. Turns out you can use hardware transactions to execute critical sections protected by the same lock in parallel if, it, if they don't conflict with each other. So you can eliminate uh, unnecessary synchronization in, in existing lock-based programs. You can use hardware transactional memory, um, perhaps with, uh, with hybrid transactional memory down at some level to improve the performance and scalability, and importantly, simplicity of various system software, the operating system, virtual machine, whatever, uh, so that even without the world switching to transactional programming models, the world can begin to benefit from uh, transactional memory. There's um, really neat tricks for using best effort hardware transactional memory to op optimize non-blocking data structures so that you can make the common case really fast even though the, uh, the, when the hardware transactional memory fails, you've still got to go and do tricky, complicated algorithms that require proofs, and which some people even do. Um, there's some really neat optimizations for those kind of things. And there's dot, dot, dot here, which hides all manners of sins, uh, which I won't uh, get into. So we've got a message for hardware people and a message for software people in here. A message for hardware people is give us your best effort. Don't just look at the unbounded hardware transactional memory proposals in the literature and scratch your head and f figure out how to, f uh, you know, whether you can uh, address all of the issues that, that, that remain unresolved in those things and say, oh, this is just too complicated and risky. If you get yourself to that point, think about doing your best effort. It, it really simplifies your life if you're allowed to just say, eh, that one's too hard, I'm going to abort this transaction. Um, and as I just alluded to on the previous side, best effort hardware transactional memory supports a bunch of other um, purposes beyond just changing programming models. And because in our work we have assumed very little, we've sort of made the, the most basic assumptions about what the best effort hardware transactional memory looks like. We give maximum flexibility to hardware designers. Uh, having said that, though, there are a bunch of things that we don't require from the hardware transactional memory implementation in order to make hybrid and PHTM and things like that work correctly. But if they supported some additional functionality or features that would make life much better for us. Um, and so uh, perhaps there can be a bit of a trade-off here. We made your life much more flexible. How about using some of that flexibility and simplicity to give back a little bit to make our lives better? Um, and so some examples include feedback. Why did my transaction, my hardware transaction, just fail? That's a really critical question, it turns out. If you failed because of a conflict with another transaction, there's a good chance just retrying or perhaps backing off a little bit and retrying is the right thing to do. But if you failed because you hit, tried to use some functionality not supported by the hardware, or you had an unlucky cache mapping, or you had a huge transaction that didn't fit into the cache, or whatever the reason is, you can retry it until the cows come home, it's not going to succeed, you might as well go to software. And if you say, well, I'm going to retry enough that if there's contention that's the right thing to do, then you waste a lot of time doing that while, uh, when you're never going to succeed. So you'd really like to have some feedback to, to give you good decisions about that. And our simulator doesn't give us any such feedback. All we know is, oh, we are boarded. So we're planning soon to uh, improve our simulator to demonstrate the value of this kind of information. Um, in addition, if you can give some guarantees for some really simple transactions, let's say every transaction that accesses at most two cache lines can always eventually exceed, so you don't need a, a, you don't need a software backup path for such transactions, that um, 
uh, there's a lot of power in, in that kind of guarantee that can, for example, substantially improve the, uh, the implementation of, of uh, software transactional memories. Because uh, that guy who's left, you know, he asked me, how do you make those things atomic? Well, the truth is it's worth quite complicated algorithms that we've worked on really hard. If we had best effort hardware transactional memory that guaranteed just for little transactions that you could always do it and you don't need a backup path, that would, you know, I haven't quantified this, but I feel like it would make an order of magnitude improvement in, in the simplicity of software transactional memory designs. Okay, so our message for software people is that we think transactions can improve scalability and substantially uh, simplify your life. We don't uh, claim to be there yet. We don't have all the functionality that you might need. We don't even claim to understand exactly what functionality you would need. Performance is still not fantastic. We're getting better and better and better. Uh, but we don't think that people should just wait until everything is solved. Better to get involved earlier, try it out, let us know how it works or doesn't work, influence the programming models and the implementation. If, if, your, if your real workload is the real workload that everyone tunes their implementations for, then you win in the long run. Um, and the other reason for doing that is that um, the more and the more realistic transactional workloads we have, the more we can use our simulators to show, look, if you went and built just best effort hardware transactional memory, you don't have to go and do the whole thing. Look how much improvement you could provide and also provide guidance like, you know, this is how much resources you should put on cash so that 99% of the, the transactions, uh, sorry, I should have said on chip, but, you know, cash is a, a directly relevant, of course. Um, how much resources should we put there to make sure we get almost all of the performance that we could get from a, from a much more complicated, unbounded uh, implementation. So just to wrap up and sort of repeat some of the things that I said, hybrid transactional memory uh, supports transactional programs today, and you can use best effort hardware transactional memory in the future to improve performance, and better best effort in the future beyond that to improve it again, even though the application code doesn't change at all, its performance continues to improve because the underlying hardware and software transactional memories improve. Um, yeah, we're, we're improving the performance of software and hybrid transactional memory, approaching the performance of an unbounded hardware transactional memory. I don't have a strong opinion whether we will ever need unbounded hardware transactional memory, but I think that's an open question. It may be that with a best effort, with a good best effort, you know, round three of, of the best effort hybrid transactional memory, we might get to that point and say, that's enough. You know, we're not going to buy any more by putting more complexity to get those last 0.01% of transactions or whatever. Um, and again, best effort hardware transactional memory supports a bunch of other purposes beyond just transactional programming models for, for improving the performance of, of applications and systems that exist today. And, and so m the last takeaway point, just repeating what I just said, is that we argue for building best effort hardware transactional memory sooner rather than later uh, if, if uh, unbounded hardware transactional memory is not feasible or not uh, consistent with your hardware budget or your complexity, uh, your risk profile and so on. And uh, that's it. I'll be very happy to take and even try to remember to repeat any more questions. Yeah. I think I've got a few questions. Uh, what, what is uh, about this, uh, the hardware support? Uh, what would it take to be able to run uh, uh, strong transactional memory uh, together with existing code without slowing the existing code down. So let's say I, sooner or later I will want to use a string in a transaction. Uh, I don't want to slow down other users of string outside of transactions just because I use the string in my transaction. So I don't want to slow down everything else just so I can use a transaction here. What hardware model is necessary to do this? OK. Um. I think the question is, what level of hardware support is necessary so that we can uh, support, and did I catch you say strong in that? Yeah, so we can support strong atomicity, meaning you don't have to worry about which parts of your program are transactional and which parts are not, and make sure that they don't touch the same data at the same time. Let's take that burden off the programmer. And, and uh, just as a footnote, I am quite sympathetic to that point of view because, again, you know, our primary goal here is to improve life for the programmer. So it's my view that we should resist uh, putting burden on, on the programmer to improve performance before we've really wrung out every ounce of performance. So, so then the question is what support would be required for that? Um, so 
the most generic answer is just, just the best effort, right? We can do all of that uh, with software transactional memory with one or two small caveats, but putting some, um, uh, some overhead even on non-transactional code. Now, that overhead, the, there are a lot of opportunities for quite simple optimizations for those things. And in fact, there's a paper presented uh, by some Intel folks at PLDI just this week describing how to do this. Um, and describing their work on it. That's not zero overhead. That's what you asked me for. Well, um, <laughs> in any practical scenario, you, you will be using third-party libraries who are, which are written in who knows what. You have to call them. So uh, the, the comment is, you know, if you're using third-party libraries, you don't know their implementation, you don't know what's in there, you've got to call them. And, uh, and so the, um, if you want to support strong atomicity, you don't really know if what those things are doing in those libraries might be accessing data concurrently with your transactional code, and you need to do something about that to make sure that they interact correctly. Um, and, and I think the question is, what level of hardware support would be required to make the overhead of that zero? Um, I will hazard a guess that you cannot make the overhead zero without very complex unbounded hardware transactional memory. But I'll also hazard a guess that you can make it small enough that it's not, that, it, that it's acceptable. Uh, but I don't think we're there yet. The other question I have is that you made a claim that transactions make the programmer's life simpler. Uh, so going back to your original example, the, one of the two queues, suppose I, you know, one thing that's reasonable to do with a queue is to implement it on a remote machine and just use RPCs to, uh, do you know, insert things and delete things from a queue. If I were to make a small change to my program, uh, how would it even work? I mean, if now the queue is because uh, you cannot undo it anymore, how would you do that? Right. So if you don't mind, I'll translate your question into a standard TM talk question, which is how do you handle I.O.? Right. You, <laughs> the, the, the question is what if, going back to the, the FIFO queue example, what if I were implementing that FIFO queue on another machine through RPC calls? I, I don't have the ability to send out an RPC invocation and then decide later, oh, sorry, didn't mean it, take it back. Well, actually, you kind of can. Okay, so, so the I.O. question is... Um, um, a, a wise man once told me it's uh, either a solved problem or an unsolvable problem, uh, depending on the type of I.O. And, and what you consider an adequate solution. For things like implementing, um, for, for things that don't have user visible external actions, this stuff you can do, right? So you can have, for example, um, you could do some kind of I.O. like you could fire off that RPC call and you could have um, a, um, a compensation action that says, oh, I didn't mean to do it, so I'm going to send off another thing that says, hey, uh, uh, please undo that. Now, that requires the RPC implementation and the thing at the other end to be aware that it's in transactions, right? So it's not like it just plugs in and works. Um, for other kinds of I.O., the, the favorite example people like to use is, is fire the missile. It's kind of tricky to say, oh, sorry, missile. Um, it turns out that I determined that I was under attack based on an inconsistent read set and uh, better bring that missile back, uh, there, there you're kind of stuck. So, um, for, so, so put it this way, for some kinds of I.O., it can be engineered into transactions. For other, for other kinds, uh, you know, there's, there's not much hope if you've got transactions that have a mix of, of input and output visible outside of the system. Um, you're, you're stuck with solutions more or less like sequentialize everything and don't let anything happen. And, and, but, and in this case, you can't, su you can't support an explicit abort. But there's, there's various techniques, but none of the solutions are, uh, you know, are, in my opinion, ever going to allow someone to say, it just works, don't worry about it. So okay. what do you do? Do you use locks or what? Well, so the, the, I guess the, uh, so the question is, what do you do? Do you just use locks? The, the approach of, oh, okay, I'm going to sequentialize everything because I know I'm going to do I.O. and only have a single transaction, yeah, I guess you could call that using locks, right? Um, now, so this is kind of, uh, in, in my view, so in our, in our paper that I mentioned before about integrating transactional memory into C++, we say don't allow I.O. in transactions. That's, that's the first thing to do. Now, the immediate response to don't support feature X 
in transactions is, oh, well then, you know, uh, what you said about trans transactional memory solving all of the world's problems is never going to be true. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, you said it would make uh, life easier. But... Yes, and I believe that. But uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, I am not one of those people saying it's going to make everything trivial and uh, cover all of the cases. And, you know, I don't claim that transactional memory is the programming model of the future. I think it is something very promising for supporting programming models of the future. But I'm not the one saying you can do everything you want. It's it's a uh, it's a useful box in the in the toolbox, I guess. I think it is. Other questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, how do you make transactional memory predictable? Yeah. For this, uh, uh, and the, the other canonical example, I have a database of you with lots of short mutating transactions and I want to take, you know, uh, do a full scan of it in a transaction sometime. How does that ever complete? Right. So the, so the question is, I guess I'll again translate it to a sort of more canonical question. What if I've got a big long transaction and I've got a bunch of short transactions that conflict with it? I've basically got a difficult trade-off, right? I can either starve that long transaction forever um, or I can make the, those short, apparently simple transactions wait for a really, really long time because of this long hardware transaction. So this. I would argue uh, is, uh, so first of all, let me say, th there are techniques, the sort of flexible uh, mechanisms for incorporating different contention management policies so that you could implement either of the things I said, right? Make sure everyone eventually completes, possibly at the expense of making a short transaction take a really long time, or, um, you know, the priority is on those short guys that need to get done. It's possible to implement both of those policies. Uh, it's my opinion that you absolutely should not burn into the implementation either one of those policies. It's really, if, if you're an application programmer and you wrote an application that has those kind of characteristics, uh, one question is what's in your mind? What, what, what do you want to happen, right? Um, you, if you are, it's almost like you basically have unreasonable expectations at this point, right? We can't make those, those small transactions fast and predictable and guarantee uh, that the long transaction event eventually completes. And so... Um, but does the hardware implementation affect the policies you can choose, or is it uh, independent? So the, the question is, does the hardware implementation affect the policies you can choose? Uh, I'll say yes and no. It affects the policies that you can use fast. Right? You've always got the ability with hybrid TM to back off to software and use whatever contention management policies you can cook. But, uh, but obviously, uh, you're, you're already slowing down to do that. What happens with the contention between hardware transactions, yes, the hardware implementation affects that. The, the simplest uh, uh, proposals would simply say, abort the transaction upon conflict, and now you've got to go retry it. And then there are other proposals that say, oh, let's uh, do some kind of queuing or some kind of timestamp-based thing to try to guarantee progress. There you introduce more complexity, and perhaps you baked into the hardware that policy, and it might be the wrong policy for a particular application. So my view is, um, there are probably some reasonably simple contention management policies that you bake into hardware that work well for most of the cases, but you definitely need the flexibility to sort of stop and say, oh boy, this, this is a tricky situation, probably created by a somewhat naive programmer. If, if the expectations are, you know, I've got that mix of transactions and I want everything fast and predictable, probably that we didn't educate that programmer well enough. Um, but the, the flexibility is there. It's just, you know, the, there are realities as in anything that you, you can't sort of have everything at, at once, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you.